Um, <clears throat> well, thank you for inviting me. Um, as I said in the beginning, this is the 100 years since the um, promulgation of the Balfour Declaration, which was a statement sent by Arthur Balfour, the Foreign Secretary of the War Cabinet uh, in Britain, to Lord Rothschild for communication to the Zionist Federation. Uh, but it didn't just spring up in 1917. And one of the things in looking back at the whole question of the Balfour Declaration and how it came about was really to explore what was the background to it, uh, why it came about, and what its intentions were and what it actually says. Uh, and those aren't easy answers to give, although they may appear uh, very simple that we can kind of uh, identify exactly what was behind it all. I think in looking at it, I want to look at the three major components, if you like, or three major uh, players in the situation, the British, uh, the Zionists, and the Palestinians. And I think that in a lot of history that is written, uh, it's very much simplified that this is a story about the British and the relationship to the Zionists. And I think the history of the Palestinians is very largely written out of what actually was taking place and is completely neglected. So one of the things that I was trying to do in sort of research that I did was to look at what was the Palestinian response to what was taking place, what was their awareness and knowledge of what was happening and what the British were doing, and how did they, uh, how did they attempt to deal with it. And I think the starting point is very much uh, that of the First World War and of British imperialism of Britain's record right the way through the 19th century of acquiring territory in Africa. Uh, Africa divided up between the major imperial powers of Germany, France, and Britain. And a Congress being held in Berlin in 1882 where they were talking about how this division should be conducted. And a part of that, of course, the expansion of the British Empire, which had been going on for many decades, if not centuries, was the acquisition by the British of India and of territory in East Africa. And when we talk about India in this moment, we're talking not only about what is now the country of India, but also Pakistan and Bangladesh. So we're talking about a huge uh, area of land with colossal resources, which the British, to put it bluntly, pilfered in order to fill the coffers of, uh, of companies in Britain. Uh, and actually also, during the First World War in particular, utilized the uh, men, uh, and it was exclusively men, who were recruited to fight in the British Army uh, against Germany and against the Ottoman Empire. So India was a major, a major question of concern. The British, as you know, took things like cotton, raw cotton, spun it into fiber in the, the mills of Lancashire, made it into garments and sold it back to the Indians, making a colossal profit whilst at the same time preventing the people of India actually establishing factories and training the skills workforce that they could have done very easily to actually carry out exactly the same tasks and of course thereby accruing the wealth and generating the wealth for the development of their own country. But this is a story which is the same in relation to Palestine, a situation of imperial imposition, imperial theft on a grand scale of the resources of the uh, countries which they occupied uh, apart from which they took. So India and East Africa was again a major component of interest for the British. Virtually from Egypt, right the way down uh, the eastern coast of Africa to South, South Africa, there were British colonies. Countries that we now talk about like Kenya, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and so on, were all part of the British Empire. And of course, to access those areas and to maintain their control in those areas, what was critical to that was their access to the Suez Canal. At this point in time, virtually, well, certainly no commercial aircrafts. They were all war planes if they existed. Uh, there was no um, other way, and the canal was a critical part of the British Empire. More than 50% of all the vessels on the oceans were actually under British flags. And the trade that was conducted was, uh, as I say, something that uh, was clearly uh, exclusively in the interest of the British. So the Suez Canal was important. It was not just a kind of minor factor. Uh, one magazine in the Second World War described it as the carotid artery 
of the British Empire, absolutely central to Britain being able to, and I've mentioned Africa and I've mentioned India, but of course Australia and New Zealand were part of that whole uh, sweep. And the canal was central to, in, in, to that. Now in addition to that, something that began to emerge, and I think not enough attention uh, has, has been uh, given to it, and that is the importance of oil as a, as a resource which began to expand rapidly at this point in time. In 1912, for example, Winston Churchill, who was then the first Lord of the Admiralty, signed a, a, an agreement that would ensure that all British war vessels would be transferred from coal fire to oil fire. And that meant the expansion of the range of those vessels by 50%, the reduction of the crewing of those vessels uh, so that more uh, fighting uh, soldiers and members of the crew could be put on board and change very rapidly uh, the functioning. So oil became increasingly important. And it crops up in the discussions around Palestine in all sorts of ways of people looking at uh, why, uh, and I'll come on to talk about this in, in more detail later. So oil was an important factor. Between 1910 and 1920, the expansion of oil uh, was 11-fold in terms of Britain's consumption of oil. It became an increasingly important factor. And when they were writing about what they would do after the First World War in anticipation of defeating the Ottoman Empire, they talked about the importance of being in a place to have control over the oil fields that were discovered in what was they call Mesopotamia before Iraq and in Persia, Iran. And they were all of those within the Middle East orbit. And the British were keen to do this because they didn't want to be dependent on the Americans for oil. They wanted to have their own sources and they wanted to be able to kind of control those, if not actually occupy the lands uh, where those oil fields were sited, at least have uh, an economic relationship with the, uh, the area that would give them uh, dominance over it, and it wouldn't be, make them have to go cap in hand to America, which at that moment in time was the major producer of oil outside of Russia. And again, uh, that's another kind of part of the equation. So in the First World War, the British were ranged against in alliance with the French and the Russians at that point in time, up until 1917, were arranged in alliance against the Germans, Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire was important because, as you can see, it was very close to the Suez Canal here and stretched all the way down the Red Sea. So that whole waterway, of course, they needed to have control over if they were going to maintain, not just the Suez Canal, if they were going to maintain their ability to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, trade with and, and have economic relations and uh, continue the maintenance of the empire in India and in East Africa. And at this point in time, Russia, under the Tsar, was interested in trying to gain access to the uh, Indian Ocean over in this area. And the country that they were looking to access that through if not to have territorial control, at least to have access to the Indian Ocean, was through Afghanistan. So Afghanistan was somewhere that was, and these are all names, aren't they, that are still cropping up in political discussions that we're having now. Afghanistan was, if you like, uh, a, a part of that. So the British anxiety about the Russians was that should they wish to try to make some alliances with uh, Persia and with this area and gain access to uh, the Indian Ocean would be in a position to cut off, uh, again, uh, Britain's ability to send military, military um, um, uh, support to India uh, very speedily. So as well as the Suez Canal, they were also anxious about the land uh, bridge between uh, the Mediterranean and the what we call the Persian Gulf. Uh, because they wanted to uh, be able to um, move troops rapidly should the situation arise across that area. And in the course of discussing what would happen after the First World War, they talked about actually uh, being able to do this. Uh, the Germans too were looking to, to do it at the same time. Their idea was to build a railway line from Berlin uh, up here, off the map in the north, through to Baghdad. They wanted to do that in order to be able to enhance their relationship with the, with the Ottoman Empire and be able to themselves, if you like, operate in that area. The British were worried 
that if uh, Germany and the Ottoman Empire were successful in the war, those two routes, both the sea route through the Suez Canal and through the Red Sea, and the land route across the Mediterranean uh, from um, this area in the northeast of the Mediterranean through to um, the Persian Gulf would actually be closed off. And Lord Kitchener, just as a bit of an anecdote, in 1915 wrote a paper called Alexandretta to Mesopotamia. And this was a document which actually described in some detail Alexand Alexandretta Port up here in the northeast through to this area, the importance of it. And one of the ideas they toyed about was actually that in the uh, area uh, here uh, up from the uh, top of the Persian Gulf in this area is a city again whose name you'll be familiar with, Basra. Mm -hmm. They talked about actually building a colony there and drawing um, settlers, colonists from India, uh, from the Muslim peoples of India, to actually create a settlement there that would be an enclave uh, sympathetic to the British. So this idea of taking settlers from other parts of the world and utilizing settlers from other parts of the world to, en en to um, ensure, if you like, or to facilitate the British project in terms of controlling this area was not simply something unique, as I would argue, to the Zionists and the alliance with them in terms of building a colonial settler state in Palestine, but also was something they were toying with in other ideas for what they wished to, to carry out. Now, in this war against uh, the Ottoman Empire, against Germany, one of the things that they wanted to do was to create an alliance with uh, Arab peoples uh, and to bring them on board. Several of the countries had broken off from the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, Algeria, Libya, Egypt was semi-independent, and the countries of the Balkan area uh, had become independent. What they wanted to do was to try to ensure that these uh, facility of the Ottomans to operate in this area and down through uh, towards the uh, towards Aden at the south of the Red Sea was actually limited and they would not be able to carry that out. So in doing that they carried out discussions with Sharif Hussein who was an Arab leader based in, in Mecca, some of you will know the geography better than me, but around this area uh, in the Arab Peninsula, uh, with a view to creating a, an alliance with the uh, Arab leaders to fight uh, against the Ottomans uh, and to uh, ally with the British. And they did that. Uh, after a series of negotiations and discussions through letters and correspondence between Sheriff Hussein and uh, a man called McMahon, uh, who gave an undertaking essentially that the British would, um, in return for their support against the Ottoman Empire, would support the right of the Arab peoples to create their own independent countries. On the wrong way on the maps. And the area that the, the Arab peoples wanted to define as the countries which should be independent was determined by uh, a document that is usually called, often called the Damascus Protocol, uh, which was adopted in 1915. So at the same time that the British were discussing with Sharif Hussein about what kind of uh, agreement they'd get, the Arab peoples were stating very clearly what they wish. Uh, this map is slight, very, very slightly inaccurate. This borderline should actually go through these towns that are indicated here and should loop around Aden, which was a British uh, occupied piece of land. I won't say protector, <laughs> that's what it's usually called. I think it's a bit of an insult, really. So you can see that there was a very clear conception by the Arab peoples of what countries they were talking about when they talked about independence and independent countries. Uh, there was no ambiguity. And the letter that was sent by Sherry Hussein, which became part of, um, if you like, the terms of the agreement with the British to fight against the Ottomans, defined that area it, using exactly the same words that had been expressed in this protocol in 1915, naming all of these towns which would constitute the northern border and the border with Persia and the area of the peninsula, going right the way around up to the Mediterranean, so clearly including Palestine as 
part of the deal. No ambiguity in terms of where um, the RFP sort of stood. In terms of the British, however, they had different ideas and they were discussing these things at the same time, in the same breath almost, that they were discussing with the Arab peoples about what the outcome of the alliance might be. They were discussing with the French how they were going to uh, divvy up the Ottoman Empire after the war and after their presumption that the Ottoman Empire would be defeated. And this is a copy of the map which they drew up, a map drawn up by a French um, diplomat who was assigned uh, by the government of France to conduct the negotiations called Georges Pico and uh, uh, Mark Sykes who was allocated by the British to discuss these. And these things were going on separately from the correspondence that I talked about between the Arab leaders and the British and behind their backs without their knowledge of what was going on. And as you can see, very crudely they drew uh, the map uh, and drew a red line which was going to be the border that they anticipated between the French controlled and influenced region to the north and the British controlled region of Mesopotamia, what is now Jordan, uh, and through to Palestine. There was in the document a certain degree of ambiguity about Palestine because they didn't want to, they saw that they, if they were too de definitive about taking over control of Palestine, that this might alienate the French and they might sort of want to um, uh, break out of this agreement. So they talked about part of Palestine being under international control, particularly the areas of the holy places of Jerusalem, uh, which is, uh, you know, places of uh, significance to the three uh, religions of Christianity, Judaism and Islam. Uh, and that was uh, something that they cordoned off separately. But it was to be undertaken on the role of control of Palestine was to be undertaken under British control. Uh, and again, you can see here a little red area, which was actually uh, Haifa and Acre, which they wanted to have as a British port. And again, going back to the oil issue, the idea was to build an oil uh, line from uh, Mosul, which is in this uh, district, across through to the Mediterranean, which would terminate at Haifa, and therefore they wanted to have control over it. And it was one of the reasons why the, uh, why the border line between, that was drawn between the French and the British was where it was, because the British wanted to keep the route of the oil pipeline within that part of the, uh, the deal, if you like, that was under uh, British control. What, what's the blue zone there? Because it isn't entirely Kurdish, is it? But partly, and didn't the no, this British and French promise the Kurds something and then renege no, it, on it? This isn't Kurdish at all. This is so Anatolia right and a southern Turkey Kur Kurdish area yeah. war there. in that, that zone. Mm -hmm. But they didn't come into the reckoning on this particular discussion. So what's the significance of the blue zone as such? On that? Well, the, 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 um, there were those areas that they anticipated coming down to control of and those areas which they had influence over. So they were going to set up, um, if you like, client states, which were going to be uh, economically tied into Britain with uh, all kinds of trade deals or whatever, and politically tied in, and um, be kind of under the aegis of the British. Uh, although, uh, coming on to you know, what happened in terms of the First World War uh, was the allocation of mandates, which was uh, the British essentially wrote their own uh, document saying, you know, we want to have control of Palestine. The, the, uh, the areas were divided up in that kind of way, uh, but each of them kind of saw them as uh, either being directly under their control or actually being areas that would be uh, in close relationship with them. And um, that, was, uh, that, was, that was how they, they viewed um, the agreement. So, so the kind of bits were the bits under direct control, the, the, the white bits were the bits to make that the um, Arabian people. Um, I can't hear you, sorry. No. Is this a private question, sorry? I said that, that the, um, weren't, there were the coloured areas, the bits that were under direct, direct control, and the, and the non coloured areas are the bits that they were going to allow the Arabian people to. To, to nominally have, have control over it. Is that right? 
But that, that's uh, roughly that's, that's the case. Yes, I mean the, the all of these areas which were given under mandate by the by the League of Nations. Can we leave the questions to the end? And then okay. Um, the, the areas that were given to the France and Britain under the League of Nations were all, in any case, um, categorised as being uh, a category mandate territory. And there was a differentiation between uh, areas A, B and C, areas which they deemed to be not the areas A, B and C of Oslo. Um, but there were areas which were deemed either to be on the brink of being ready for independence, or ones which in due course the imperial power would deem had reached a level of development uh, that would um, enable them to become independent, or were ones which they had saw as being long-term projects. And all of these areas, and this just comes back to you know what the status of them uh, was, all of these areas were deemed to be A-class mandate areas. In other words, areas that the League of Nations theoretically believed would become independent countries. So the, um, I think the, the point that I think is essential to looking at the Balfour Declaration is that this wasn't uh, a, a discussion which took place between Zionism and the British uh, outside of any kind of context. There are, and I'm not disparaging about it, but there are those who say that the whole question of the relationship between the British and Zionism was built around uh, the religious traditions of certain strands of Christianity that thought that the fulfillment of Christian ambitions, uh, or if you like, Christian uh, achievement, would be the return of the Jews to Palestine. That would mark um, you know, a moment when um, there would be a fulfillment of religious promise. And certainly there were those within the British cabinet who had those kind of views, people like Lloyd George and Balfour himself and others. And it, indeed, it's arguable that uh, the notion of Zionism and promoting the idea of a Jewish state had more roots, more profound roots, in elements of Christianity than it did in Judaism. Uh, and if you look back to the 19th century, you'll find uh, people who write and comment about this. The, the novelist George Eliot wrote Daniel Durango, in which she talked about um, you know, this being an aspiration. And she said, actually, that she saw that as a contribution to making people aware of uh, the plight of the Jews. And certainly, one has to say that uh, Jewish people at this time in the 19th century faced colossal persecution, pogroms, attacks, and so on, uh, and massacres. And one can understand, uh, it's not about agreement, but understanding why the view should emerge that the solution to this was the creation of a national home, uh, a national state. Um, but it's interesting, you know, when you come on to look at the discussions in the British cabinet, that this wasn't a uniform view. Zionism from the end of the 19th century, right the way through, I would argue, probably until the 1930s, was actually very much a minority view within the Jewish community. It was a view of only a, a, a tiny handful. And it wasn't even itself um, uniform in its character. There were different strands of Zionism, different attitudes were held by different groups of people. At the outset, for example, the idea was to have some piece of land on which to create a Jewish homeland. It wasn't that they wished to go back to Palestine. That wasn't the first uh, initiative that, uh, that was brought forward by, by Zionism. Indeed, in the beginning of the 20th century, in 1902-1903, they wanted to create a homeland for the Jews anywhere they could be given land. And they went to every major imperial power, to Russia, to Germany, France, Britain, and so on. And the British were the ones who responded and offered land in, uh, in the Sinai uh, area between Egypt and, and Palestine. And that um, didn't really come to anything uh, in this area, which is far from Palestine itself, to offer land or some space of land in that area. Not that, even that whole area that I just indicated, but a piece of land within that area. And that uh, was, was jettisoned, but the more, much more serious proposal was to give land in East Africa. I talked about the East African colonies. Uh, 
and to put forward a proposal that there should be land given in the area of what we now call what was called Uganda uh, and that general area. And they drew up a constitution and the solicitor who was asked to draw it up, a young member of parliament, was David Lloyd George. He drew up this uh, proposal on the basis of the same kind of terminology that the British had used for the creation of the East India Company. In other words, it was seen as a commercial venture which they were entering into, uh, something which they wanted to um, set up uh, that they saw as being uh, potentially beneficial. And those people who had that view within Zionism were called the territorialists. They were people who wanted just some land to have a home on somewhere. Then there were those who uh, adamant that their uh, desire would be that the creation of a homeland would be uh, on the territory of Palestine. And yet a third group who belonged to Zionism but held views that uh, in a much more orthodox traditional sense of Judaism that they didn't believe that it was up to Jews themselves to take any steps or any measures to create a homeland because this was something through uh, religious tradition, it was firmly believed was something that was not in their hands to do and indeed they should not take any steps. You still, there's still um, a, a current uh, of that character we see sometimes on PSC demonstrations called Netarai Carter, who are the rabbis who sometimes come on our demos much bigger in America than, than in Britain. Uh, but they belong to that uh, religious uh, tradition of Judaism, which was in fact the mainstream uh, of, of, of opinion. So I'm going to jump a bit because the whole point about the Balfour Declaration is that even within the Jewish community there wasn't a uniform position. There were people who opposed it <coughs> quite strongly and when the uh, negotiations began to draw up the Balfour Declaration which didn't take place until the early part of 1917 although there had been some kind of exchanges going on uh, they put this out to various members of the Jewish community and asked for their opinion. Um, Monte, uh, someone called C.G. Montefiore, who was the president of the Anglo-Jewish Association, denounced it. He said that Herzl's idea that um, the notion of anti-Jewish prejudice, anti-Semitism, was something that was, uh, could not be removed, was irremovable, was something there forever was something that was completely anathema uh, and that it actually was playing into the hands of those who were prejudiced because the creation of a homeland of four Jews would lead to the encouragement of anti-Semitic views of people saying, well, you've got somewhere to go, go. Uh, and that view was also uh, shared by uh, Mr. L. Cohen, who was the chair of the Jewish Board of Guardians who went further than that and said that in his view, and this was not uncommon, this is not uh, you, you probably some of you have seen the, the books of um, Shlomo Sand, who's written a book called The Invention of the Jewish People, or <coughs> The Invention of the State of Israel, very recent books. Uh, they were of the view uh, that um, the Jews didn't constitute a nation, that they were a religious ethnic group, but uh, nationhood was not something that they should aspire to, and for the same reasons as the previous person I mentioned, Montefiore, they regarded it as being dangerous that they should actually even embark on it. And the most vociferous and incredibly articulate and sharp critter, uh, critique of, of, of the whole project was made by a man called Edwin Montague. Montague was actually the Secretary of State for India. So well within the kind of imperialist framework, you know, part of the setup, and he precisely attacked it for all those reasons that I've just said and for more. And he regarded the British government as actually being anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish for actually embarking on the project because he said that it would, also, it would lead to um, a, creative a state of instability and vulnerability of those Jews who remained in Britain uh, and wanted to live their lives in Britain and didn't see the creation of a, of a state as being uh, something that should be undertaken. So I'm going to jump because I realise I've been talking quite some time about the, the position then of the Palestinians. Because as I said at the beginning, I think this is something that is very largely written out of history. The idea that, uh, and the often repeated kind of remarks that you get 
from, uh, from staunch Zionists, and of course you have from the former Prime Minister of, of Israel, uh, Golda Meir, who said the Palestinians were not a people, um, and the whole mythology of uh, a land without people, uh, a land that was barren, that was uncultivated, and so on. And of course this is just a complete nonsense, uh, and completely untrue. In the 19th century, uh, the uh, uh, fruit industry was very well developed. Uh, they were actually exporting wheat uh, to London to be brewed into beer um, as, uh, as part of the commercial ventures that they were on. And there was a whole kind of uh, relationship that was going on uh, in, that, in that district. And Palestine was seen as part of Syria, uh, part of greater Syria. So this region of here was seen as one. Cities like Nablus, which some of you will have heard of in the northern part of Palestine, were more related to Damascus uh, than they were to Jerusalem. They were more related to Haifa, to the uh, big ports on the, on the seaboard. And Jerusalem was not seen as a particularly significant political city, a commercial city. It was seen as a, a religious center, revered. Uh, it was uh, something that was obviously within people's uh, framework but it wasn't necessarily seen as part of it. And when the First Arab Congress came together in 1919, after the war, to talk about what they wished, they wanted the creation of a greater Syria, linking uh, Palestine, Lebanon, what is now Lebanon, and Syria together as one whole unity. And they made a very clear statement in doing that. They said that that nation should be constituted, all the people who live in that territory, including those Jews who lived within that area. So they were very clear in differentiating themselves and saying that the Jews who lived in the towns like Jerusalem and, um, and Hebron and um, uh, Safed and others, Tiberias, should be part of that nation. It wasn't in any way an attempt to exclude people. And later Congress has reaffirmed that and said that quite clearly. The British, however, had other plans. They decided that this was going to go ahead. And in 1918, just a few months after the Balfour Declaration was signed, they sent Herbert Samuel as the first High Commissioner to Palestine uh, to continue with the occupying forces in running the area and managing it. And during that time of the British occupation, it wasn't just the case that the political rights of the Palestinians were denied their social rights, their economic rights were denied. And that was, I think it's important to grasp that. The Palestinians were very clear that they wanted to have self-determination, they wanted to have independence, and they sent delegations to the League of Nations uh, in Lausanne, they sent delegations to the British making clear what they wished to do. But every time the British came back with a formula which was to establish some kind of structure in which Jews and Palestinian Arabs would have parity, when the actual reality on the ground was that 90% of the population was Palestinian Arab, Palestinian and Muslims, and only 10% was um, belonging to the Jewish community. And yet they had the idea that the structures that should be established should have this parity. On top of which, the British retained the right of veto. So nations saying that this was a category A area which should have the right to familiar with because of the cosmetics thing was actually much more important than that and even today it's more important than that. It was a colossal resource for the production of potash and was an invaluable uh, source of potential wealth and yet that too was given to pro-Zionist uh, entrepreneurs to take over and control so the Palestinian economy uh, was distorted. On top of that, in coming into uh, the area of Palestine, uh, those who were uh, the militant Zionists who came in, many of whom became members of the history group, uh, were uh, of the view that Jewish employers should not employ a single Palestinian worker. And so you had a situation where land that was bought from very largely absentee landlords like the Sursuks who lived in Lebanon meant that Palestinian farmers and peasants were driven off their land, forced to go and try to find work in areas like Haifa uh, and in other industrial areas. And once arriving there, 
found that employers, Jewish employers in particular, would not employ them. So they were uh, made uh, not only landless, but uh, jobless as well, and driven into poverty. So th the issue of the mandate, of the British mandate, was not something about uh, the British, as some history books would have you believe, actually ruling over two um, warring factions or two disputatious factions who were unable to reconcile with each other. But it was a systematic running of a structure, political and economic, with social consequences, that ensured that the Palestinian economy and Palestinian society was unable to grow. I think, therefore, talking about celebrating 100 years of Balfour is absolutely something that we should consider anathema. And I hope that uh, on November the 4th, when there will be a demonstration uh, about this in London and indeed in all the other activities that you're considering, I hope there will be big participation to show that uh, we reject Balfour on what it stood for and that it should have no place in history. On the contrary, the Palestinians should receive the justice that they deserve and be given the right to self-determination. Thanks very much. Thank